First in this module, I just want to introduce intensive and extensive properties, and then we're going to do some very introduction to conversions and dimensional analysis. We will expand on that in another video. But what are intensive and extensive properties? These are things that are always one of those ideas, again, that are kind of in the back of our mind, like law of conservation of mass. It's always kind of behind there in our mind, but we're not actively talking about it all the time. An intensive property is something that is completely independent of the amount of substance present. So density, for example, is an intensive property because density is calculated as the mass over the volume. As I increase the mass of a substance, its volume also increases. Density is intensive. It doesn't matter how much I have of something. It's a great way to identify what a substance is, though. So intensive properties will come back to throughout all of chemistry. But not all, but a lot of intensive properties, such as density and molar mass, can actually help me identify species. By species, I mean what molecule or compound it is, what, com what, what is it made of. So density, again, mass over volume. As I increase the mass, the volume also increases. Therefore, density can be used to identify something. Density is temperature dependent because volume is temperature dependent. We will talk about that in a future chapter as well. Molar mass is another example. We'll be introduced to molar mass soon, but molar mass is the grams of a substance divided by the moles of that substance. A mole is a um, number word. Mole represents how many of something I have. Temperature is also an intensive property. It doesn't matter what, how much of something I have, it's that temperature. If I have, you know, five liters of water at 25 degrees C versus, you know, if I have a, um, five milliliters of water in the same room, they're going to be the same temperature. They're both 25 degrees C. It doesn't matter how much I have of it. Extensive properties are dependent upon the amount of substance present. So that's things like your mass, your volume, the number of moles, the heat. So mass of something, how much I have of something, the mass of something is dependent upon the amount I have of it. If I have more of something, it's going to weigh more. If I have more of something, it's going to have a larger volume. Number of moles, again, we're going to talk about soon, but this correlates to the number of things. I apologize. It's hard for me to write on the bottom of my iPad like that. And then heat. What is the heat of something? Not the temperature. Heat and temperature are not the same thing. How much heat something can release, though, is an extensive property. Okay. So let's spend some time talking about dimensional analysis. And here I'm just going to introduce it. We'll do a couple of quick calculations, and then we'll spend more time in a different video doing more complex calculations. Dimensional analysis, though, is solving word problems by focusing on the unit specifically. So I want you to follow this four-step method when you're doing dimensional analysis. The first thing I want you to do is write down what you want to know. The second thing I want you to do is start with your given measured quantity. What are you given? What measurement are you given? I want you to apply conversion factors to cancel your unwanted units. So I'm trying to get from one unit to another, and I'm going to do it through dimensional analysis. I'm going to do it through conversion factors. Double check and ask yourself, does my answer make sense? And did you remember to put your units at the very end? Did your units cancel out properly? Did you go from the units that you started with, and are you at your desired unit? Conversion factors themselves are inequality. They equate out to inequality. These are some conversion factors you need to know. There will be more. But these ones just flat memorize right now. One inch is 2.54 centimeters exactly. If you look at a ruler where you see the mark for 2.54 centimeters, it exactly matches up to one inch. The reason it's important that that's an exact measurement is it does not limit sig figs. in calculations. One milliliter is one cubic centimeter. One cc stands for cubic centimeter. That is also exact. 12 feet is exactly, or sorry, 12 inches is exactly one foot. Three feet is exactly one yard. Exact measurements don't limit sig figs. 2.205 pounds is one kilogram. That is four sig figs. This is four. The one is exact. That can be 1.000. It doesn't matter how many zeros you put, but the 2.205 does have four sig figs to it. 
or you can remember 454 grams is exactly one pound with three sig figs. I don't care which one you use, but you need to be able to convert distance between the metric system and the U.S. system. You need to convert mass between the um, U.S. system and the metric system, and you need to be able to convert volume. One liter is 1.057 quarts. There is four sig figs here. So this is the equivalent of saying 1.000 liters is 1.057 quarts. And 2.205 pounds is 1.000 kilogram. Okay. Again, I did write three feet equals 1.0 yards here, but this is an exact conversion. So that's the same as saying 3.00 feet is 1.00 yards. It doesn't matter there because it's an exact conversion. What are conversion factors though? Conversion factors are that they're just inequality. I know that if I have one inch, I have exactly 2.54 centimeters. What that means is if I have one inch over 2.54 centimeters, numerically that equals one. The numerator and the denominator are the same value. They just have a different unit to them, but those two different units equate to the same value. There are qualities where the ratio is equal to one, and we take advantage of this and use it to relate two different units to express that equality. Be careful and make sure you're using the right conversion factors. This is what messes students up when they memorize their metric conversions. You've got to be careful, okay? What do I mean by that? I mean I can write 100 centimeters to one meter. I know that it takes 100 centimeters to equal out to one meter. I can write it with the centimeters on the top and the meters in the denominator, or I can write it with meters in the top and centimeters in the denominator. Same thing. It means mathematically it equals to one, so I can write the conversion either direction. I'm going to write it in order to get my units to cancel. I could also write this as 10 to the second centimeters to one meter or one centimeter is 10 to the negative two meters. They all mean the exact same thing. I could also write one centimeter 0 0.01 meters. They all mean, you don't even have to have the extra zero there. Uh, they all mean the exact same thing, okay? But figure out which way makes sense to your brain. Do you like them with the big numbers? Do you like it with the positive exponent, or do you like it with the negative exponent? I have no preference. I can read whatever you do. As long as you do the right conversion, I have no preference. When I see this miles per hour here, that literally means that I travel 65 miles in one hour. 65 miles per hour. It's giving me a conversion factor. Notice here, this is what I was trying to talk about above, the correct versions versus incorrect. It takes a lot of picometers to equal to a meter. A picometer is really, really, really small. So I need 10 to the 12 picometers to equal up to one meter. But if I want to use the other conversion, if I want to use the conversion the other direction, it takes a very small number of meters to equal one picometer. It is wrong to say one meter is 10 to the negative 12 picometers. This is incorrect. The negative 12 needs to go with the meters. If I'm doing the number with the picometers, I make it positive 12. Be careful with your conversion factors when you're doing this. When you measure those metric conversions, this is where students are going to mess it up. So for an example here, let's say I want to find my number of meters, and I am told I have 1.76 picometer. I do not care if you put this 1 in the denominator. A lot of students need to see it there because they need to see the conversion of it. I don't tend to write that, okay? And I'll, you'll see that when I do the examples in a minute but 1.76 picometer, and I'm trying to get to meters. I'm gonna use the conversion factor to get that to cancel out. So what I did here was I used the conversion factor here. I'm trying to get to meters, and I'm trying to cancel picometer. I know it takes very few meters to equal one picometer. So 10 to the negative 12 meter to one picometer. This crosses out my picometer, and it gives me meters, which is my goal, and then I plug it in my calculator and I get 1.76 times 10 negative 12 meters. The other way that you could write this, again, number of meters, 1.76 picometer, but if you, like the big, if you like numbers looking bigger, not smaller, I could have also written this as one meter, 10 to the 12th picometer. I will get the exact same answer because it's the same conversion. 
1.76, 10 to the minus 12 meters. But I need you to pick which one makes most sense to your brain and use which one makes most sense to you, okay? Another conversion we have is density. Density is one of our most useful conversion factors. It stays with us throughout Chem 1 and throughout Chem 2. But density can absolutely be used as a conversion factor. Density is defined as the mass of a species over its volume. When you have a liquid, not always, but often you'll see it represented as grams per mil. It doesn't have to be, but it's very common. When you have a solid, you're often going to see it written as grams per centimeter cubed. Again, doesn't have to be, but it's very, very common to see density written that way. But for example here, the density of ethanol is 0.789 grams per mil. Express this as two conversion factors. Well, I can write 0.789 grams for every one milliliter, or I can flip that over and say one milliliter is 0.789 grams. Students are comfortable with this because they see it written that way in the density. But if I'm trying to get to milliliters and I'm trying to cancel grams, I may need to flip that conversion factor upside down. It works because the equality itself is equal to one. So it doesn't matter what's the numerator, what's the denominator. I do have to keep the 0.789 with the grams. And then when it says per mil, that is implying one milliliter. I do have to keep that part straight, but I can flip these around how I want. Let's do uh, two simple examples here. How many feet are in six yards? And then how many yards are in six feet? So dimensional analysis, the first thing I do is I write down what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find my number of feet. Second thing I write down is my given measurement. I am told I have 6.0 yards. Next, I'm gonna write down any conversion factors I have to get from the unit I have to the unit I want. Notice this is in my numerator. If you need to, it's totally fine. You can write divided by one here. You can divide anything by one. If you need to do that to emphasize in the numerator, please do. I don't usually do it, but I don't care if students do it. But notice my yard is in the numerator, which means I need my yard in the denominator. I need to get rid of it. I do know that three feet equal one yard because I have my conversions memorized. So I know that if I have three feet, I have exactly one yard. This cancels out my yards and gets me to feet, which is my goal. Now, I'm just, now that I've got my units squared away, I'm gonna go ahead and do the math. 6.0 times three gives me 18 feet. Let's check our sig figs. Here, we have two sig figs. This conversion is exact, so it does not limit sig figs. My final answer, we'll have two sig figs. And then don't forget your units. And then ask yourself, does my answer make sense? I know that there's more feet in yards than yards and feet. So yeah, it makes sense that my number looks bigger because a yard is a bigger space. If I'm looking at a foot, I'm looking at less distance. It's gonna take more of them to equal the same space. The second question, how many yards are in six feet? So this time I'm trying to find my number of yards. I'm starting with six feet. Now, as before, I had feet in my numerator and yard in my denominator. Now, I need to cancel out those feet. So I need to put my feet in the denominator, and I know it takes three feet for every one yard. This cancels out my feet, leaving me behind with my yard, which is what I want. Calculate this out, and the calculator just tells me two. Let's check our sig figs. Here. I have two sig figs. This is exact. My final answer needs two sig figs. Six divided by three is just two, but I need two sig figs. So I need to put point zero there so that I emphasize I still have those two sig figs. I can't lose the precision of my measurement. And then I'm going to write yard for my units. The next video will have more difficult examples of conversions, but make sure you get those conversions down memorized so that you can do the more difficult dimensional analysis examples.